Hi, my name is Steve Plank and I'm an identity architect in Microsoft UK. And we're going to talk about identity, specifically identity on the internet. And we'll have a look at all the problems which are caused by identity on the internet, identity theft, and we'll look at some of the solutions to that from a technology point of view. And we'll also look at some of the solutions which we can use technology to solve some of the uh, human problems. Let's have a look at the topics. So first of all, we'll have a look at the idea of phishing and fraud, all those ways of um, capturing uh, a user's or a, an individual's uh, secrets. We'll then have a look at the identity layer, look at the seven laws of identity, look at how we can uh, concentrate on two specific laws which are important for this talk, the laws of human integration and consistent experience across contexts. Then we'll have a look at the identity metasystem and we'll concentrate on the IP, the identity provider, the RP, the relying party, the user, and a piece of software which runs on the user's computing device, whether that's a, a laptop, a desktop, whether it's running Windows or Macintosh or Linux or whatever, uh, known as the identity selector. So those are our three topics, very simple, phishing and fraud, identity layer, the identity metasystem. We've all seen one of these, a login to a web page. In this case, it's the Hotmail web page. And the problem with it is that it runs inside one of these. It runs inside a web browser. And the problem with web browsers is that uh, they get their pages from web servers. And the problem with web servers is that they are under the control of somebody else. That's always the problem with a web server. All the code that gets downloaded to your machine, all the HTML, all the interaction that you have with that machine is first of all written and configured by somebody, placed onto the web server, and then the web server delivers it to you. So effectively they control your user experience. This can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. Let's have a look at how this can be a bad thing. If I type in my email address, gullible at hotmail.com, and I put my password in there and I click the sign in button, then it'd be very possible that that data could end up in a bad person's database. You see, the thing is, a lot of people don't realize when they go to a website that the URL is quite important. You can see here that I haven't actually gone to um, Hotmail. Maybe somebody has sent me a link in an email. It's actually uh, been hidden, www.identitytheft.com, and I've ended up at the wrong website. I've now, now given them away my username and my password, which they can now go away and do whatever they want with. This could have been an online banking site, something which would possibly be a bit more serious. Although you will frequently find that uh, if I knew your account number and a few other details, I might be able to go to your online banking account, try and log in, say I've forgotten my password, and then because I've got your Hotmail password, I just go into your Hotmail account and there will be your password. Okay, sometimes they'll use a slightly uh, a slightly cleverer way of getting a hold of your information. So when you look at this, first off it looks genuine, www.mybank.com. At that point, most people's minds will switch off, but then the astute amongst us will notice that .net, .iwill, .take, .over, .your, .life .com, slash .dodgy.php, the rest of that URL is not something to be ignored, it's something to be feared because you're almost certainly, with a URL like that, being fished by somebody. Now let's have a look at the problems that enterprises have when they want to link maybe their partners and themselves together, or maybe they just want to expand their customer operations. Here we've got an IIS website, we've got a user. Um, typically, the authentication for an IIS website for an internet-facing IIS website is probably going to have forms authentication enabled, in which case there will be a credentials database probably there. Um, there's one that comes with ASP.NET, but you may create your own much more complicated database for credentials. And what happens is there's, um, there's a way that you can set a login cookie using forms authentication in the ASP.NET code that runs on the IIS server. So what happens is when the user logs in and correctly provides a username and a password, an authentication cookie is sent to their machine. That cookie contains data, part of that data is encrypted, so that when future requests come back to the IIS, uh, back to the IIS server, the, um, 
the cookie can be decoded and we can be assured that it's the one that was issued to that web browser. Now let's imagine that this company that runs this IIS server, they go away now and they buy a couple of other companies, Newcorp and Megacorp. What happens now? Well, we want to uh, log on to their sites seamlessly. You know, if you've bought a couple of other companies, wouldn't it be great if you could just use the login cookie and the login credentials that you've already been given? And it would seem logical to just accept a cookie from your own IIS server. But the problem is if you do that, a certain error will occur called the cross-domain cookie. A cookie has been received from a security domain other than the one to which this web server is a member. This is a potential security breach. Please consult the application or web server administrator. That means somebody's going to be phoning you up and asking you why it doesn't work. And your solution, your answer to this problem will be, well, let's build a solution to solve this problem. Let's not worry so much with cookies. Let's have some other kind of token and let's use something like HTTP post and let's post those tokens around and let's just use a credentials database in one place but issue tokens, issue cookies from each of the servers. The problem with this solution is that it needs a custom solution. And then you go away and you buy another company and that needs to have engineering work done on its identity. And you buy another company and another company and another company. Meanwhile, some other major corporation has been buying ten companies and now somebody wants to bring your company and this other major corporation together and you've gone down completely different custom solution routes for your identity infrastructure. And so now, one of those companies, typically the one which has been acquired, ends up having another custom solution foisted onto it by the powers that be in the acquiring company, typically. So there's a major amount of engineering work that has to be done to solve these problems. As we look at the internet, we can find at the bottom there's a layer which we call connectivity. Above that layer, there is a naming layer. And we would call the connectivity layer IP and the naming layer DNS. There are lots of ways you can connect nodes on a network together. You don't have to use IP. Some of you might remember the old uh, NetBuey protocol. There's IPX, SPX. There's uh, different SNA protocols. I come from a digital deck background. There was uh, DECnet number of different ways to connect computers together but IP is the one that we tend to use well we use exclusively on the internet DNS there are a number of different naming schemes you may be familiar with the NetBIOS naming scheme just a you know a server name and um, on a particular subnet that's resolved through simple techniques like um, like broadcast um, however DNS is the naming standard which we have chosen for use on the internet um, the interesting thing about both of these standards is that as long as we all participate in the same way, as long as my IP address is conformant with the standard and your IP is address is conformant with the standard, then we have an infrastructure which allows us to talk to each other. It means that you can visit my website or I can visit your website. As long as our DNS system all conforms to the same standard, it means that when I type in www.yourcompany.com, I end up at your company's website. If I was to suddenly reinvent DNS and say, well, my naming scheme is going to be slightly different. I'm going to have www.microsoft.com, then I would be a web server on my own on the internet with nobody to visit me.